Steve Stewart, Chief of Police of the Muncie Police Department, and I welcome you to this special edition of the show. Uh, today you're going to be introduced to several officers who have recently been promoted. Um, most of them were promoted to the rank of sergeant, and we have one, uh, two new lieutenants. Uh, it's important for you to know that uh, in order for this police department to move forward, uh, uh, we must have good supervision throughout the department. And all of these uh, men and women that have been promoted recently are of that breed. Um, our young officers coming on the police department and those with two to three years on really need that guidance in how we police our community. Uh, all of them that have been promoted are uh, outstanding police officers, outstanding people. And I think as you listen to each one of their interviews, you'll get a different insight into each one and, and know that they're out there um, in various divisions of this department, most of them in the uniform division, uh, protecting and serving this community and leading those young patrolmen. Uh, it's important for me as chief of police that we have these excellent leadership in those positions and I couldn't be more excited for, for each and every one of them. Hi, I'm Mark Volmar. I'm the deputy police chief with the Muncie Police Department. Been deputy chief for three and a half years and I've just started my 33rd year uh, in, with the Muncie Police Department and it seems like it's gone by fast. Um, you guys are going to get to meet some of our officers that have been promoted in the last three and a half years and we just had about six officers promoted in the last few weeks and it'll give you a chance to meet them and see what their perspectives are on their new jobs and how they think their their job description changes and what their challenges might be um, and it's really an interesting time for them because I remember doing the same things um, being a sergeant is one of the best jobs you can have in law enforcement because you're still right down there working with all the men and women that are taking all the calls, but you're part of the management now. So you've got a fine balancing act and uh, there's a learning curve for it. And most officers do um, make that transition successfully. There's a few that just, they were fantastic patrol officers uh, and they, they don't see the uh, change they need to make now. Uh, they need to become a sergeant and they need to manage the shift because now they're responsible for 20 officers when when they were just a patrolman or a patrol officer. They were kind of responsible for themselves only. And uh, the situation I use for this, like imagine if you were a construction foreman. Um, you're supposed to be watching the entire project. If there's a house being built um, you're supposed to watch, there's people pouring concrete, there's people putting um, beams up, there's somebody putting drywall up. If you stop to go help the guy put drywall up, then you can't see that the concrete guy is pouring concrete in the wrong spot. So that's what I try to tell all these new sergeants. Um, you're not a patrol officer anymore. You're a sergeant, your job has changed. And sometimes that's difficult for people in the beginning because they feel like, well, someone's going to get on me because I'm not, I'm not actually doing police work anymore. Well. Your jobs change. If you want to continue to do place, place work, just stay a patrol officer. And there's, there's no shame in that. And, uh, but that's what I remind people about. And most of them are able to make that change. And that's a good thing. And then you're going to meet some people that have been sergeants for a while and they've just become lieutenants. And their job is going to change a little bit too, especially depending on what division. If, uh, if you were in detectives as a sergeant, now you've gone back to uniform as a lieutenant your job changed a lot there so there's learning curves. Um, all of our officers that get promoted to sergeant go to a two-week supervisor school and that starts them off and we try to get them schooling as they continue because you know you're never too old to learn. I'm, I still try to learn something all the time and there's plenty for me to still learn at this job and that's what makes it really challenging and interesting for me. I like to talk about our community here. Um, some people like to divide it into sections or, or uh, areas, and I don't like that when I hear that. 
I mean, we're all one community. You might live in Whiteley, you might live in Robinwood, but as far as the police is concerned, it's just, it's the community of Muncie. And I think we do a pretty good job talking to different uh, parts of town. Uh, I know early in our um, tenure here, the mayor and the chief steward and myself and the prosecutor, we went and talked to neighborhood associations and because there had been a issue with crime under before we took office and it was starting to get a little violent and we let everyone know that this is a two-way street. We can't do our job without the help of everyone that lives in our in our city. And I think we did a good job of conveying that and I think people knew we were being sincere with that and they took that message back to their neighborhoods and to their neighbors and we saw a reduction in our shootings that we had here um, and I'm sincere when I really say that it's a two-way street and I believe in that and part of that is our officers need to remember when they go on calls to try to explain to people why they're there you know sometimes we have a bad habit in, in, a, in a, a small amount of times where we show up and we feel like we've got to take control and there's one way to take control and we don't always listen but if we go to calls and we tell everyone, said, I'm going to listen to everyone here. I'm not going to prejudge anything. I'm not going to make up my mind what happened. I'm going to listen to each one of your stories, and then we're going to resolve this. That is in the best interest of everyone. And I think people see then we're trying to be fair. They see that we're trying to be professional. When, you, when your community feels like your police department's trying to be professional, you'll see more cooperation with those people. They may not always be happy about things we do, but they have a firm belief that, yes, you're just doing your job and you were fair about it, and they'll start cooperating. Uh, you'll, you won't get as many as, I didn't see anything, which we do have an issue with sometimes. Um, you'll see uh, some of your uh, arguments start to slow down because, or the resisting arrests start to go down because people think, we're being fair, so let's, you know, let's all be civil, and that's the best way to improve community relations is just explain why we're there and that we're trying to help and we're not always going to make people happy but we're doing it in the best way possible and most people will see see that's what you're trying to do so we haven't had any bad issues like some communities have and I hope we never do and I can't imagine that because I really think we talk to groups all over town on a regular basis and I think it's really helped us out my name is Steve Cox. I'm a captain with the Muncie Police Department. I've been with the Muncie Police for ending 23, but start my 24th year this October. Um, this past March, I was promoted to captain and was put in charge of the Uniform Division uh, here at the Muncie Police Department. Uh, prior to that, I was lieutenant for eight years. Um, had some uniform shifts, day shift at a time, the third shift or the midnight shift at different times. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to run the detective division for the past three years prior to my captain promotion. Also during that time, uh, I was in charge of the SWAT team or the tactical team. I did that once I became a, a lieutenant. So I was in charge of the TAC team and, and uh, it was just, it's a really, it was an enjoyable position being a lieutenant. I was actively involved in the SWAT team, actively involved detectives, things like that. Well, now I've reached my promotion of captain. Captain is, once, once somebody enters the uh, promotion process, uh, most people have the goal to go as high as you can and get your highest merit rank, which is captain here at the, the Muncie Police. And I've achieved that, so I'm, I'm proud of myself. I don't you know, want to sound like I'm bragging or, or anything like that, but, but, but I am you know, I'm happy that I was able to obtain this rank. Uh, Currently, I run the Uniform Division, as I stated, so I'm in charge of uh, basically a majority of the department uh, because the three uniform shifts comprise the backbone of this department. It comprises the most, uh, the most number of officers, and uh, ultimately, I am the head of that. Each shift, three shifts, have a lieutenant and three sergeants now, which is a, is a nice structure. It makes the chain of command flow and communication flow. Um, quite a bit easier and smoother so better communication uh, allows for better effectiveness, better policy and um, 
just kind of keeps the machine working well as it can? Uh, a little bit of being a police officer and in, in a city this size, we're a, we're a mid-sized city if you want to call it that. Uh, you know, we're not Indianapolis, we're not Louisville, we're not something like that, but we're, you know, 70,000, 60,000, depending on when school's in session. We are a well-rounded department in terms of what we see and what we deal with. I've been here 24 years, as I stated. Um, I have seen anything from, um, I mean, basically well-experienced, let me put it that way. I, I've, I've been the patrolman. I've been a sergeant, lieutenant, now I'm captain in charge of different divisions, so I've seen uh, run criminal investigations such as homicides to drug investigations to basic uniform calls for service. Um, things that stand out in my mind and, and things that I really uh, remember and are, are things of different times when we've been able to help people. It's probably 12 to 15 years ago at some point. We came across a family that was deaf except for one child. She basically ran the day-to-day -day operations of that family. She was the one that could communicate with utility companies, with, with banks, with school administrations. You know. And it, I was so impressed with that child, thinking how in the world does she being, I think she was 11 years old, if I'm not mistaken, 11 or 12 years old, she was running the day-to-day -day activities for this family because of uh, the, the language barrier or the, the barrier between the family or, or the, the, the deaf members of the family and the community who couldn't make, you know, establish good communications with them. But she did this. And I just, I, I think of this girl quite often. I just wonder kind of what became of her. You know, I, I'm sure she's an adult now or close to it if not but uh, things like that really stand out in my mind and, and and the way we were able to help her you know she needed help she was the one that contacted 911 we responded took care of the situation that that that, that she had that day uh, it made me feel good to be able to help her uh, but I but I sit and think that you know she's the one that really is kind of the uh, you know, I guess I don't quite want to say hero, but she's, I was really proud of this, this kid. The way she handled things and the way she, way she just had to grow up and how mature she was for that age. Things like that stick in my mind. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum are some of the uglier things that we see. Uh, the homicides, um, particularly involving children, things like that that you know, that's always going to stick in somebody's mind. That's just the last thing that you're prepared to see or want to see. Obviously, we don't want to see death in any kind of uh, scenario, but however, when it's a child, you know, and I've been involved with several investigations over the years, these are the things that really stick in your mind and you make you wonder, how does this happen? Well, how can somebody do that to somebody else? Um, and, and again, there's, there's several that I've been through as far as those investigations and you just, you think about them, you think about them quite a bit. Um, along the same lines, we start talking about officer involved shootings, uh, several officers here at the police department that have been shot themselves, uh, including myself. That happened in 2003 on a search warrant. Uh, I was shot in the leg during, um, just prior to the breach. But you know, just sit and think, gosh, you know, you think it can't happen to you and there's several other guys who thought the same thing in their first few years when you get your job, you're gung-ho, you get out there, you don't think it's gonna happen to you, but the fact is it can because there are people that wanna do harm to the police uh, regardless, you know, just have no basic uh, respect for authority and uh, just, it happens. Uh, we've basically, uh, we've been pretty lucky here. We, it's, you know, the last, um, officer killed in line of duty was Greg Winters back in the early 90s, 90 or 91. Um, I wasn't here at that time, but I've, I've heard quite a bit about Greg and what, what a guy he was. 
Um, I think about that, what would it have been like if I knew him, and, and how does that affect guys on the department now that were here then? I think about that quite often. Um, but you know, this, it's, this job has offered such a wide spectrum of thoughts and emotions, all the way from the good things that we've been able to do for people and the good things that have happened to us, all the way to the bad things of society and things that we've had to go through and things that we've seen. And it's just, but you know, I, I, I could not trade this job for anything else in the world. I couldn't, you know, people say, well, how do you do it? And I'm like, well, how do you do what you do? How do you, how do you, you know, sit behind the desk and crunch numbers if, you know, if that's what somebody does. I mean, it's just not for me. I just, it's hard for me to imagine doing anything else. It's just, you know, it's exciting at times. It's, um, you get a feeling of, um, uh, you know, I guess it's pride. I mean, you get, you get a feeling of pride knowing that you were able to help somebody. And, and for the most part, we're, we are well respected in the community. You'll have that 10% that, that, that don't respect us. You know, the 10% rule that 10% of the people cause 90% of the problem. Uh, but um, but it's, it's, been, it's been a really good run. And uh, I've still got several years to go, too. You know, I have two kids. One that's a sophomore and one that's uh, an eighth grader. So I'm not going anywhere until they're out of college. So I'll be here a while. I think after a, a critical incident such as an officer-involved officer shooting where one, our guy, one of our guys have had to take a life or in situations where some of our guys have actually been shot or wounded, uh, there, there becomes a camaraderie or a different kind of camaraderie that, you know, it's, it's like you can, there's different things you go through after it happens. Um, you know, they, they, they talk about, you know, they talk about the life, your life flashing before your eyes and you think back and think, well, it's actually, it actually is true. I can remember that happening. Uh, I know that the guys that have had also had it happen to them have said the same thing because you're immediately concerned that, you know, you can't believe that this just happened to you. You're trying to stay tactical. You're still, you're, you're still trying to stay in the fight, but at the same time, there's family uh, and a lot of different things going through your mind. Don't want to don't want to deal with it, but we have to deal with it. So that's one thing too. Besides the other, us, the guys that have been involved in that kind of situation, allowing to talk about it, we try to make sure that the rest of the department or uh, younger guys also are aware of of different aspects of 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 what can happen and what you need to expect if you're involved in it. There's in the area of seven to eight guys in the department, and my numbers might be off right now, but that have either been involved in an officer shoot or have been shot themselves. So it's, there's a lot to learn from it. Um, I guess if there's a silver lining to it, that's, it's that we can talk to other guys and, and, and prepare them for it and let them know, you know, here's the situation. I talked to the state police tech team once. Uh, they wanted to know my perspective of what happened with my situation. And uh, a lot of them were like, wow, I didn't think that or consider that you know there's a lot of lot of lot of questions that I answered for them that maybe some of them didn't know or didn't realize mm -hmm. different things that you go through that uh, that that you they hear firsthand and I think firsthand experience goes a long way as opposed to maybe reading it in a book somewhere that you know different things like that basically the the, the biggest component of my life except for my job is definitely family. Um, I mean, I, I put family first, obviously, but uh, as far as time, I, you know, I coached my daughter in softball. Uh, I've coached my son in baseball for several years. Uh, right now, the baseball side or the softball side of it is, is still taking up a lot of time. We are just finished a good run in, in the Little League World Series. Uh, won the regions, which or won the state uh, of Indiana and, and made it to regions and finished second in regional. Uh, it was just, I mean, it was a nice, it was nice, uh, it was a nice experience, especially for my daughter and her friends. But, you know, coaching is one thing that I've done for uh, probably six, seven or eight years in the past, as long as my, my, my kids were little. Other than the coaching, I, I, I like to golf, however, I can't golf as much because 
of the, the, the kids and the traveling that they do with their sports, the volleyball, the softball, and the, uh, the baseball. Uh, fishing, give me anything to go fishing. But again, it's, you know, it's about finding time. I'm not going to wish this time away with the kids. You know, it's their time. It's, it's, we're there to make sure they get what they need, and we're going to get them there and, and, and take care of all that kind of stuff. But uh, fishing and golf will definitely be something that I pick up once that time is over. Uh, yeah, fishing, I think, more so. It's, now that I think about it, that's, that's what I'd go do right now if I could. I just, you know, don't have time. Uh, you know, I have my, my merit rank of captain. Um, I have that. So, I mean, that, that is one goal. So obviously, I've met that. Uh, long term, you know, I still may have eight or nine years here. Uh, is there a possibility of becoming a, a deputy chief or a chief? You know, I'm not quite sure, but that would be something I definitely would entertain uh, in the future, that idea of becoming uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the, the chief's office. Uh, you know, once that's once that happens, and or if it happens, and then looking at retirement, I haven't quite thought that far yet. I've just started to look into all the retirement process, but I'm still a ways from it. So, to, 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 to sum it up, though, I, I like the position I'm in right now, running the uniform division. If a position ever came open, or I was offered a, a spot at, at the top in the chief's office and chief Stewart's um, office over here now. Um, it's definitely something I would I would definitely entertain. Uh, yeah, I'm getting back to to the chiefs, um, Chief Stewart and Deputy Chief Omar. Uh, they have they've provided me with a lot of opportunities. You know, they came into office and they allowed me to uh, run the detective division, which uh, I'm very grateful for because that was a tremendous experience. Um, and as far as making me a police officer, it actually allowed me to be more of a well-rounded police officer. I was a detective for years, um, but the supervisory side of it and really knowing the entire process and knowing what it takes to, to complete a case and what, you know, what needs to be presented to the prosecutor's office, um, you know, them giving me the, the chance to run that division and then the, um, the promotion to captain, uh, just very thankful for it. Uh, not a lot of people get to sit in my shoes. There's only two captains here at the Muncie Police Department, um, and I'm one of two of them, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, and there's a lot to be learned from uh, Chief Stewart and Deputy Chief uh, Volmar. Uh, I get to see different things that they have to deal with, and it puts things in different perspective. Um, you know, you, as a patrolman, you think, okay, there's the chief's office, and maybe this is what they do, maybe this isn't what they do and you just but as I get higher up the chain of command I, I, I have a pretty good idea of what it is they have uh, to, can, to contend with on a daily basis uh, budgeting staffing uh, procedure policies different things like that that they that they that they deal with daily and weekly and it gives me just a much better idea of how that works and and being this close now or being in the captain position uh, Gives me some good insight and some good good training um, down the road that if it if it were to happen that I could step in and, and be a, uh, in a position as in the one or two spot the chief or deputy chief spot. Um, but that opportunity again, it's it's something they gave me and I'm I'm very grateful for it. My name is Lieutenant Seth Stanley. Uh, I came on the Muncie Police Department January 4th of 1999. Um, my grandfather, Calvin Stanley, was a reserve for the Muncie Police Department uh, dating back into the 60s. And then my father, Steve Stanley, um, came on the department, I believe, 1974. Um, and he was a lieutenant when he retired after about 29 years of service. So that's kind of what made me want to be a policeman. Um, you know, I can remember being a little kid as far back as probably four or five years old. And I remember my dad worked on the midnight shift in uniform, and I can remember staying up late on Fridays and Saturday nights and uh, when he would go to work at around 10 o'clock and helping him put his uniform together and being up early in the morning when he would get home uh, from his uniform shift and, you know, wearing his, his police hat and his badge and stuff like that. So 
I mean, really, it, it was kind of ingrained in me at a very young age, um, you know, to be a police officer. And, you know, even going through school, you know, I was a biology major in college and, you know, kind of wanted to do other things, but it was kind of always in my, in my heart, my blood, um, to be a policeman. So, you know, after almost 17 years, here I sit today. I've been pretty fortunate to do a lot of things here on the police department. Um, like I said, I came on in 1999. Um, I worked on the road on the midnight shift for about eight months before I went to the uh, Indiana Law Enforcement Academy in Plainfield, Indiana. And then once I went to the academy and graduated and came back, I worked on the midnight shift in uniform uh, for about two years. So during that time, you know, you're just learning, you know, how to be a policeman and, you know, what the responsibilities are and kind of, you know, honing your skills in law enforcement. Um, and within those two years, I became an FTO or field training officer. So that was kind of the first school that I went to, um, a school to be, you know, to train other policemen, which for me was a, a great accomplishment with only having a couple years on um, and being asked by, um, you know, the administration at the time, um, you know, to do something like that, to train other policemen. And then shortly after that, um, I went on the, the uh, Muncie Police SWAT team, and that would probably been around 2000 or 2001. Um, so, you know, that was, that was probably the next milestone was going on the SWAT team, and, um, you know, that's a very uh, kind of precedented spot you know, for a lot of policemen is, you know, to attain something like that. And then from that point, I went in and worked in narcotics. Um, and at the time, it was the Muncie, Delaware County Drug Task Force. So it was a drug task force made up of Muncie Police Department, Delaware County Sheriff's Office, uh, at the time, Ball State Police Department, and Indiana State Police. So it was a kind of a four um, departmental task force uh, you know, doing drug crimes and, and things of that nature. So that was kind of my next stepping stone. And I worked in narcotics for about eight years total. Um, during those next eight years, um, I'd went back to uniform a couple different times. Uh, you know, the bad thing is seniority plays a role in the police department. And I was the, the least senior guy in the narcotics division and for manpower reasons I had to come back to uniform for a few different times but I would say uniform has always kind of been in my blood um, even though I love working narcotics and you know, working investigations and now being a supervisor there's, there's just something about putting on the uniform and sitting down in that police car and just going out and you know, being a policeman and, and you know, helping the people of the city. So, um, but yeah, so for the next eight years, um, I was in, worked in narcotics. And I've been, I've been very fortunate. I can't even tell you how many schools I've been to. I mean, anything from, um, you know, counterterrorism schools to dignitary protection um, and this is during the narcotics time, to annual narcotics schools, um, all kinds of tactical schools that have to do with, you know, being on the SWAT team or, you know, being on an emergency response team. Um, and I would say probably my next milestone during that time is I went to what's called instructor development. Um, and basically that's a one-week school at the academy, and they teach you how to become an instructor uh, to instruct the the other policemen or even other departments on different things that we train on as, as police officers. So went to instructor development um, probably in 2004, 2005, sometime around there. Um, graduated from that school. Then I went to physical tactics instructor school, um, which is put on by Dr. Weitzel. Um, at the uh, Indiana State Police Academy. And after that, I became a firearms instructor. So I could also teach firearms. And then from there, I became a patrol rifle instructor, which means that you instruct policemen on um, being able to qualify and carry uh, patrol rifles. So those, that, that's kind of what I did during that time. Um, 
in narcotics. And then I left narcotics after about eight years and I went back to uniform for four years, which was good. I mean, anytime you're in one division for that long, um, it's always good to kind of have a change of pace. Uh, so I was excited to go back to uniform and I went back to Midnight's where I came from, you know, as, as a young policeman and worked in, in uniform uh, for four years uh, until the current administration we have now. So it had been in 2012, um, I went back to narcotics. And at that time, it wasn't a joint task force anymore. So uh, it was just the Muncie Narcotics Unit, smaller unit. There's only you know, five guys working out at that office at the time compared to a dozen or 12 guys you know, 10 years prior. So um, went to narcotics. And during that time frame, um, I had, I had tested for the promotional process while I was in uniform prior to going to narcotics a second time. And the department didn't uh, promote any sergeants off that list. So two years later, there's another promotional process that goes on and I took that, that test. Uh, was lucky enough to finish first after a lot of hard work and studying and, and uh, performing good on that. So. I finished first on the sergeant's test and was promoted in April of 2014, so about a year and a half ago. As soon as I got promoted, I went to uniform division back on midnights, kind of where I where I'd always worked. And it was exciting to go back as a sergeant and work with a lot of the same guys that I had worked side by side with, you know, for a lot of years, um, and and also some some new guys that had come on the department that I didn't know very well. So I went back as a, as a road supervisor, and um, it was good to work with some of the guys I worked with before. And, you know, really the reason I wanted to become a supervisor is if you, if you want to make changes or if you want to be able to influence people um, or help better somebody's career, the higher you go up in the, in the department, I think the easier it becomes. Uh, you kind of have more of a voice. You can reach more people than you can just as a patrolman or even as just an instructor. Um, so it's kind of the motivation. And I wanted to see all my, all my friends and a lot of guys who I knew that would be good supervisors, you know what I mean, to get promoted with me. And, and that's happened recently um, with this last process. So I went back to uniform for about six or seven months and then there was an opening in our uh, criminal investigations division uh, as a supervisor. So in February of this year, 2015, I went to the investigative division as a sergeant uh, working for Lieutenant Steve Cox, who was the division commander basically. And I'd been up there for maybe two to three months and Lieutenant Cox gets promoted to Captain Cox and he gets transferred uh, to the uniform division as the division commander or division captain, I'd say. And so it, I kind of took over that division in a couple months' time. And it was, it was kind of a, a difficult thing to, um, to kind of take over because I'd always worked in narcotics. And, you know, being an investigator, investigators, if you can investigate drugs, you investigate a street crime as well. You know, investigation is an investigation, but the way that narcotics investigations are ran compared to a criminal investigation, things are a little bit different. Um, you know, kind of the avenues that, that you use in narcotics is, um, I don't know what a good word would be, a little more under the radar. You know, a lot of things are like more, more covert, more, you know, you have to be careful about the people that you talk to and the avenues that you use um, or investigative tools that you use because you're, you're trying to keep that investigation as quiet as possible so things aren't found out. So it's a little bit different going into a criminal investigations um, style. So that, you know, that took some getting used to. Um, and just you know, being a new supervisor period and then taking over a whole division on your own um, you know, there were some challenges there. 
And, uh, you know, but the good thing is we have a great uh, police administration here with Chief Stewart and Deputy Chief Olmar, um, and they were really instrumental in, in kind of getting me to where I'm at now um, and helping me obtain my goals once I got to certain places. Yeah, as far as my personal life, um, you know, I'll be 40 this year, so the older I get, you know, the harder it is to be as active as I was, you know, even 10 years ago. And, you know, the hard thing for me, I've taken over as uh, commander of the SWAT team. But even as commander, I hold myself to the same standard, if not higher, as the young guys who are on our team. Um, I have to perform as well as they do. And trying to compete against guys who are sometimes 15 to almost 20 years younger than you, it becomes very difficult. So, um, of course, you know, as a policeman, especially on the SWAT team, we have to stay physically fit. So, my life kind of centers around, you know, being active, uh, working out in the gym, um, you know, having good cardio, stuff like that. As far as sports goes, I mean, I've played softball over the years and basketball games with my friends and. And uh, you know, we would play on different basketball teams with kids in the community at the different parks and, and uh, different schools and stuff like that. Um, but then once I had kids, you know, a lot of those things kind of went to the wayside. And so I would say in my personal life, I spend more time with my kids and going to softball games that you know, my daughter plays in and my oldest daughter is a cheerleader, um, so doing things like that. So, I find myself today spending more time in the backyard, you know, throwing the ball with my youngest daughter or, you know, pitching balls to her so she can do batting practice. Um, so a lot of it's really centered around family, more so than it was when I was single and, you know, working out all the time and doing that kind of stuff. Um, but me personally, um, I'm married. I've been married 10 years this year. Um, my wife is a teacher for the Muncie Community Schools, and we have two daughters. Um, our oldest daughter is 14, and our youngest daughter is 9. Uh, I guess I won't talk about where they go to school. We'll leave that out. Um, you know, but I grew up with all brothers for the most part and all boy cousins and, you know, being a guy and guy friends. And so now it's just the opposite. Now it's all girls in the house except for me and, you know, a lot of, you know, my brothers, you know, have girls and um, so the family's surrounded by girls now instead of boys. So I think other than that, you know, everything's kind of family based. Um, I am an avid hunter. So, you know, come October 1st, I'll be spending a lot of time, you know, hunting and, and I go out west and hunt elk and, and go to different states and, and hunt white-tailed deer. And I kind of grew up doing that with my dad and my stepdad and it's just kind of always been a passion, hunting and fishing, being outside. And for me, it's, it's, it's a time to kind of be peaceful. You know, things are quiet. Um, you know, you're, you're by yourself a lot of the times. You're, you know, out with nature and things are quiet. And I think what I love the most is, you know, being out in the woods early in the morning before the sun comes up. And as that sun rises, everything comes to life. And I think you'll hear a lot of hunters talk about that. Um, you know, the birds start to chirp and, you know, the, the plants change and, you know, just every, everything that's in nature is kind of coming alive. And that's, I think it's probably my favorite part about the day, um, you know, when I'm out hunting or fishing or doing something like that. Yeah, back, um, back this spring, we, some of our firearms training is, um, done with what's called a firearm simulator. And basically it's a, it's a computer and a projector that projects scenarios onto a screen. So like, kind of like you're in school and you're watching a, a movie or whatever. And the good thing is it's kind of an interactive thing. An instructor can change those scenarios based on what the policeman going through the training is doing. So if they're using good tactics, if they're, you know, you know, verbally communicating good uh, with the person on the screen that as an instructor, you can change the outcome. It could be a shoot situation, a don't shoot situation. Um, so it really gives policemen a good um, realistic training 
that's cheaper than you know going out to the range and, and shooting live bullets and and it's it's, it's just more interactive. Shoot, don't shoot. Yeah, and and we really try out of shoot don't shoot. And as an instructor, we like to have more don't shoot scenarios than shoot scenarios because you never want to condition a policeman to shoot all the time. We actually try to condition them to use good decision making skills and for the outcome to be a don't shoot. So if I'm personally running that simulator, probably 10 to 20 percent may be shoot situations. Um, you're just trying to give policemen a, a, a better training perspective um, and how to prepare for you know, a, a critical incident like that. So back in the spring, um, there was a meeting between some of the instructors in the chief's office and it was determined that while the simulator was here in town that we would run a group of civilians through the simulator. So it was kind of the first time we had done this that we brought civilians into it. It was kind of a hand-picked group um, from all different kind of walks of life and, and professions, uh, male and female both. And so I was kind of tasked along with uh, Captain Cox and Lieutenant Eber at the time uh, before he retired to kind of come up with a, a lesson plan and so I prepared a lesson plan and we kind of knew what our window of time was with the group. We were going to do like a short, you know, 30 minute classroom uh, discussion and kind of let them know what this is going to be and what's going to take place before we actually have them do the shooting simulator on a separate day. And that 30 minute presentation turned into a two hour conversation. Um, and it probably could have went three or four hours to be honest with you. Uh, it really just it opened up and turned into something more than what we expected. Um, you know the public I think they need information about law enforcement and why we do the things that we do. So it gave them just a little glimpse of why we train, um, how we train, the reasons why we train a certain way and you know just kind of how law enforcement is, um, the laws that kind of govern law enforcement and why, you know, we do the things that we do. And it, it just gave them a lot of information and it gave them a better understanding. So from the classroom, it, that following weekend, we did the, sh the shooting simulator. We spent about 45 minutes to an hour which, with uh, each one of the participants. And I believe there were there were 10 people originally scheduled, I think eight of them went through the simulator. And I think everybody was really shocked um, on how, real, how realistic it was and um, how difficult it is to make those split second decisions as a law enforcement officer. You know, a lot of times you have to determine you know, the safety of yourself and someone else or maybe you know, deciding if you're going to have to take a person's life or stop a threat in less than a second's time. And so we, we put some people from the city you know, through those scenarios, shoot and no shoot alike. And it was very interesting to see the feedback and the reactions that we got from people that went through that. I mean, some people came out and even though it's just a screen, you're not moving around, you're standing pretty much still or static people were like breathing heavy and, and their heart rate, you know, was up. People were sweating and just the stress of it, you know, and having to perform. Um, and the good thing about it is we made some great friendships with people in the community, um, which I think is very key to the success of law enforcement, um, you know, with, with public relations. So we built some really good friendships there and, you know, that that small idea we had of the 30 minute presentation and sending them through the simulator um, has is really going to grow into probably a, a, a program that's going to continue with the public um, to give them knowledge on law enforcement uh, policies and procedures and the reason why uh, we police the way that we do today. My name is Ryan Trissel. Um, I'm a sergeant with the Muncie Police Department. I currently am one of three sergeants on the afternoon shift in uniform division. 
Uh, I've been on the police department for 11 plus years. I've spent that entire time in the uniform division, out on the streets, um, trying to make a difference in the world. Uh, I've been on afternoon shift eight plus years of that, so I've been on this for a very long time and have seen a major shift in the department in recent years from a more veteran department to a younger department, and that is an exciting thing at this point in time to have a whole new generation of young police officers wanting to come in and make a difference to the community and affect the world. And you know they're very energetic, and it's it's fun to be around them right now. Um, I've got promoted within about the last year and a half, and I'm really enjoying the promotion. It's offering a different aspect of the job to me. Uh, I originally, when I left for college, I wanted to, in my mind, I wanted to become an attorney. So I got into criminal justice as that was one of the fields that they recommended uh, heading into Ball State and did well in my studies and stuff there and started doing internships and doing some ride along with the police departments and you know during that four years I, I, I kind of moved away from the attorney thing. I'm more of a hands-on person and saw I thought I could serve my community better, make more of a difference if I went to the law enforcement side of it and after I did an internship for the local prosecutor's office and quite a few ride alongs both here and with the county police I uh, I definitely knew that's the side of the law that I wanted to get into more of the criminal side and the law enforcement side of things. I think they all kind of coincide whether or not a lot of people want to believe it necessarily at the time I mean there, there's the rewarding side of it the shop with the cops where you get to go out and be one-on-one -on -one with the kids and I, I work in the school as well and start to develop a good rapport with the students there and and everything but no matter what we do it seems like we make a difference in one way or another whether it be you know having to make an arrest of someone that person may not realize it at the time you may be setting their life on the path that they need to, to get it straightened out or if it's a crime against a person you may be giving that person that opportunity away from their attacker their you know whoever for them to take a step back and realize that's not the way they want their life to live and that may be the opportunity that they have to get out of that situation right now like I mentioned earlier we're a very young department I kinda like to be there for them uh, I don't want to age myself, but I'll say they're as their big brother to kind of guide them and help them into becoming the police officers that I know they have the potential to become and to make the decisions in that that they need to make and, and help them further their careers at this point in time, whatever their ambitions are, to set them on a path so that they learn how to do those things, do them correctly, get them the training that they need so that they can go on for long and successful careers. I think overall it's a very good relationship we have with the community. I think the overwhelming majority of the population, the residents, the citizens um, know that you know we're here to try to help them and make a difference. Um, every community you have, whether you have a town of a thousand or you know a community of seven million, there's always going to be some people that detract from that and you know maybe based through their life experiences or anything that they have going on that may not care for the police, but I think the overwhelming majority care for us and support us and want us to go out and do our jobs and do them effectively and they, they help us in what ways that they can. I, I do think that um, police work in general in here is moving more towards community policing. Um, I think just like with any profession or most things in general there's a swing of a pendulum and they kind of go you know back and forth back and forth as it swings and works its way to a happy medium hopefully in the end and I do think it's working more towards community policing. We try to get out in the community a lot more we get lots of requests to go out to different events, um, you know, with meet and greets with the community, national night out, a, um, a church block party here, and we try to staff those as often as um, feasible and that we can and get out and interact with the public and things like that. Because ultimately, I mean, the public allows us to do this job. We are public employees, you know, the taxes pay for that. And if we don't develop the trust with the community, they're not going to cooperate with us as much and, and things like that. So that bond that we have with the community is definitely something that I would love to see the police department continue to develop as we go forward. My name is Sergeant James Lennox with the Muncie Police Department. I started out as a, ch as a child, I started out wanting to be a police officer. Had respect for them, thought they were cool, saw them you know, running around town, lights and sirens, thought it was cool. Later in life, I figured out 
it's a service. I was like, okay. I liked it. I, I enjoyed protecting people. I was in the military. That was my job, protecting the nation. Now I come home and I protect my community. And I enjoy it very much. Being a supervisor, well, being a patrolman, you have certain guidelines that you have to follow and all that, along with enforcing the law and doing reports and stuff like that. But what it, when I became a supervisor, I realized not only do I have that, but now I have a lot more responsibility. I have to watch out for the officers, whether they're doing something good, praise them if they're doing something bad, scold them, so to speak. Um, and just maintain that buffer between the public and the officer if there's a conflict. So I'm kind of protecting both sides at this point. The liability standpoint of it all, didn't think about it until I became a supervisor. Now I'm really into circumventing liability, keeping it as less as possible. The department is getting more young people on and some would say that it's a young department. They said that when I came on. There was a bunch of us that came on. We've evolved. The older officers have molded us. We're molding our younger officers, steering them in the correct way that we need, that's the mission of the Muncie Police Department. For the department, I think we're doing pretty good with uh, relations with the public in general. I mean, we get out there. We don't, on afternoon shift, we're busy, and it's mainly calls for service. There's very little pro, well, there is proactivity, but it's, I'm not going to say little. <laughs> but our main time, or our time consumption on that, on this shift is uh, calls for service. We still get out there, we stop, we talk to kids, we still go to functions. Um, we just had a back to school bash, I think, up there, Escapades, I think it is, this past weekend. It's something they put on, they invite vendors and stuff. But I would like to see a little bit more community service out of my officers, if we have time. That's the big thing. We don't have time. When I worked midnights, everybody was asleep. <laughs> so that's one thing that I'd like to see my officers try and do a little bit more when they can. Sometimes, most of the time it's impossible because of our calls. Um, as far as my goals, I'm on the second rung. I want to keep climbing. On afternoon shift, we are in, inundated with a lot of calls. Um, at one time, there's at least 10 to 15 calls in pending, waiting for, to be dispatched by a dispatcher to a police officer. What happens is, is when they call in, dispatch has to triage those calls. Somebody that got a bike stolen two days ago isn't going to have the same priority as somebody that just got into a wreck or somebody that just got battered with a bat or something. So we have to prioritize those calls and based on that priority is where our officers go first. So it's not unheard of on this shift or on afternoon shift for you to wait upwards of an hour and a half, two hours before we can get to your call. Uh, we apologize. We'd like to be able to move faster. <laughs> but we too have to obey the laws of the speed limits and stuff. I have seven children. My life is to them. I pretty much go to school functions, after school functions, stay up with them, talk with them, play with them. I really don't have any hobbies anymore because between this job and it's time consuming being a police officer and trying balance that with my my kids it's difficult for me to go out and do stuff with them well you know we go camping occasionally and so on and so forth but everyday mundane stuff you know get them up go to school be there for them 
help them with their homework, stuff like that. My thoughts with the Muncie community is we're, we're a good community. We're, we don't have the problems that Ferguson has that I know of. I'm sure there's underlying issues somewhere that we're still trying to resolve, but that's society. We, somebody gets upset, we try and discuss it rationally and work out a solution. Some people, I'm, I, that's our community. I mean, we, we, we talk. We don't go half cocked and all that stuff. So the Mets community is a good community though. They, they've been supportive of officers that I've seen. Um, people that usually aren't happy with us don't like either A, going to jail or B, the advice we give them or somebody didn't go to jail when we can't take them. That's the usually discord that I get from the community. Um, but when I sit down and I discuss it with them and explain to them that this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, they're more understanding. Um, as far as the globally, the issues that we have nationally with policing and racism, I don't think apply here as far as racism goes. We have relatively a decent diverse group. I mean, it's mainly white, but there are some black officers here and female officers. And we judge more on behavior than we do on skin color, race, nationality, handicap, any of that. It's more you're driving down the road, you don't have a license plate on the back. We're not stopping you because you're black, white, green, brown, purple, don't matter. We're stopping you because you don't have a license plate. And a lot of people get upset over that, but it's still law. We still have to do our jobs, and that's mainly what we're here to do, is protect the community and enforce the laws of the community. My officers, they go into black neighborhoods, they go into white neighborhoods, they've been to Hispanic houses. I mean, we treat everybody the same that I've seen, and that's my standard. If I find out that it's different, I'll address that with my officers because it's not going to fly with me. Well, thank you for taking the time out to watch this show about those officers who have recently been promoted. Um, it's been my pleasure to introduce just a few of the brilliant men and women of the Muncie Police Department. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, you can always call them my office at 747-4822. And I thank you again for taking the time to meet these great men and women.